Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ274 to 278. Therapy quote number 274. By projecting or responsibility shifting one's undesirable mental emotional notions onto another person, the individual is defended against having to be aware of and accountable to their own thought process. So projection deals with anxiety. If there's something about us uh, that we are not aware of, but it's a part of us, uh, we may say, just say it, we might just uh, like assign it to somebody else, you know, or attribute it to someone else, or like call it projection like like a like in the movie theater you're, you're projecting onto the screen so you're projecting onto someone else something that's in you that's called a mirror defense you're creating this uh, mirror like the screen you're projecting onto the screen or projecting onto the other person that person is a kind of like a mirror uh, and it's there to help you get in touch with what you're uh, disavowing in yourself rejecting in yourself not wanting to feel within yourself or admit, admit that's, that's a, that it being a part of yourself. So that's called projecting. Uh, he originally called, so I'm calling it responsibility shifting because you're responsible, we're respon that's the moral revolution. We're responsible for assimilating, owning, getting to know our disowned, uh, what we've disowned or what we had to disown to survive our childhood. Uh, but as an adult, we're responsible for uh, being aware of what's going on. Um, actually, the quote was originally blame shifting, but I, I didn't like that phrase. I thought something there's something off with that. That's not about because you don't want to blame yourself. I think I think he meant responsibility shifting, but for some reason uh, he called it that. So I just changed it in the quote. By projecting or, okay, I'm saying responsibility shifting one's undesirable mental emotional notions onto another person, the individual is defended against having to be aware of and accountable to their own thought process. Okay, so you're putting the responsibility of the feelings, the disowned feelings onto someone else. Now they have, they have this trait or this feeling. So let them deal with it. And that's how you deny it in yourself. Someone called that being morally lazy. Or something like that but you know if the pain is there that's, that's one of the defense mechanisms to deal with the anxiety of the, of the unconscious pain and um, and then the idea is to moral revolution to notice that aha I'm projecting such and such uh, that means let, let's see to what degree it's true for me right. so to with, withdraw the projection to bring it back in because if you bring it back in now you're moving towards healing the splits. You're, you're facing the ambivalence uh, and you're assimilating your undigested hurt. That allows the, the, the splits to, to heal, to come together, to, form, to synthesize the form of a whole object. So there's um, self-reparation by withdrawing our projections. Right. An extension of projection is 275. Projective identification is a mental mechanism whereby the self experiences the unconscious fantasy of translocating aspects of itself into an object for defensive, for defensive purposes. And these are unwanted split-off aspects of the self. So the idea here is that, as with projection, these are unwanted split-off aspects of the self, something we don't know about ourselves. Uh, we fantasize, unconscious fantasy, that it belongs to someone else. We say it's that other person's. It can be direct, the person doesn't know what you're talking about, or there may be what, or mope beam projection, you find some small kernel of truth, uh, or some little evidence that the person has some aspect of what you're denying in yourself, and that serves like a hook, and then you hang your coat on it. You know, it's a pretty, like, so, so what he... The little bit that he has that's true, that's a projection hook, and then you project what you disown in yourself. Or if a 
direct projection isn't convincing, you may coax the person to demonstrate something which you're disowning. Um, now with projective identification, there's the added element of wanting to keep, to, to have some control over this ability to keep your projection. So the theory is, if you can control uh, the other person uh, the other person's uh, fantasy, if you can control your fantasy that the other person possesses this trait, then you're controlling the thing that you're denying. And in the process of doing this, to accomplish this, the person may want to control the other person, thereby controlling the thing he's denying. All right? So if he's denying whatever it is, um, if he's if he's denying that he's a person who projects, <laughs> he'll he'll make himself he'll accuse the other of saying you're you project, and then but everyone projects a little bit so he can convince himself see you're a projector I'm not the projector, you know or or he'll um, cherry pick and try to rationalize or interpret something he does as him projecting. See, you're the projector. So if he can control his fantasy, uh, he can control what he's denying, and thereby preserve the split. Because the split is, it's too painful to bring it together. Splitting precludes mourning. Splitting precludes happiness. Unhappiness is a malady of the personal synthesis. Splitting is a malady. Um, so, uh, so, <laughs> The healing is to withdraw the projection, accept it, that it's a part of ourselves. Why is it there? Why was the split there? Okay, because the mother, because that was in response to the mother we received. We received an insecure attachment style. Let's look at the mother's story. Forgive her. A reparate, that'll bring up more feelings. As we forgive the other, we start to forgive ourselves. And then we reach whole object relations. And that's a psychological birth from there. More on splitting to 76. Splitting contributes to an unrealistic view of the world in which people are felt to be all good or all bad. A major contributor of intolerance and prejudice, maturing consists of the capacity to tolerate ambivalence. So here again is the reference to the idea that um, splitting causes... Splitting is meant to be an existential hearsay by the age of three. By the age of three, the child has integrated the part representations of other and self into whole object relations. And then he no, then he no longer has these extreme opinions. It's either all this or it's all that. And um, so maturing consists of the capacity to tolerate ambivalence. So the splits are coming together. Mother was an ordinary person, caught in her existential dilemma. There were some good things about that came from her. There were some hurtful things that came from her. Put it together to see the person as a whole person, rather than fantasize that she's either a goddess or a demon. You know, like that's the splitting, right? the Jekyll and Hyde phenomena, and so on. Remember, splitting precludes mourning. You see, a person doesn't mourn because the negative feelings are too strong, so this, that, so this, that's why, that, that's what creates the splitting. If the negative memories are too strong, the person has to split it off, disassociate it. Uh, but you need this. But you need to integrate the part representation of other and self to achieve umbantu, whole object relations, psychological birth, access to the real self, access to the capacities of the real self, and all the feelings that are in the real self. Uh, the broader feelings, uh, gratitude, empathy, love, genuine love, and, and the feeling that it's okay to set goals in the real self, uh, okay, and, and then with the real self, uh, unconscious guilt is an existential hearsay. All that is over, right, by the age of three. Uh, if not, then in the therapy process, we, we do it. We, we, we do in therapy what was meant to have occurred by the age of three. Um, okay, 277. 
Alexthymic clients may experience somatic reactions as a substitute for affects they cannot identify. So he, here's the... Uh, earlier today we had a quote on the idea that symptoms deal with anxiety but they also reflect an unresolved unconscious inner conflict. Um, so it's the same idea. Uh, somatic reactions as a substitute for feelings they cannot identify. So that's an unconscious conflict. You have a feeling, it can't identify it, there's an unconscious conflict. And if you can't identify your feelings, we call that alexthymia, no words for feelings. All right, that's the Greek word. Uh, it stems from no words, feelings, no words for feelings. And um, So, yeah, so uh, if we know our feelings, uh, we can uh, resolve the unconscious conflict and the symptom will go away. That's uh, ideally, that's the goal of the therapy process, to put words to our feelings, to update the narrative, to heal our memories. Okay, one more, 278. The child's neurosis, the basic defense being identification with the aggressor. So here again, reference to the idea that if if the trauma is too great, the child copes with the with the with the rejecting mother by identifying with her in an attempt to control it or master it. So if the child has identified with the aggressor, if if he's if he gives up his own identity and becomes like her, uh, now he's that's a developmental trauma. Repetition compulsion goes awry. Uh, and that's dysfunctional baby uh, behavior, and uh, that's the she calls it the child's neurosis. If the mother provides a secure attachment, this doesn't happen. The child is free to separate, individuate, and find himself. If the child is too impinging, the child has no ch chance to do so. He's too focused on the mother, hyper vigilant. What does the mother want? How do, how do I get? How do I be safe? So now, ultimately, that can reach the point where the child just kind of gives up and just identifies with the mother. That's a very hard situation. People with a narcissistic pattern are considered in that state. They've identified with the aggressor. They are they are the mother psychically, right? So somehow. That doesn't mean everybody who once in a while says something and it reminds them of that being just like what their parents said. That doesn't necessarily mean they identified with the aggressor. That could just be a memory or something. But uh, so the, the theory here is from birth to symbiosis. Um, that's the extended womb. Remember, humans come out of the womb too early. Uh, so from birth to six months, that's the extended womb, uh, called the stage of symbiosis. The baby doesn't know where he ends, and his mother's and his mother begins. And it's as if maybe the baby thinks the mother's like the womb still. Like it's an extended womb. He hasn't fully differentiated himself and his mother as being separate people. So during that time, if the mother's thoughts are impinging on the baby, and the baby doesn't really know who's who or what, uh, it's easy for him to, it's easy for her thoughts to become part of his psyche, and then he ends up incorporating those thoughts into his way of thinking. You see, that's called identification with the aggressor, and then um, that's an insecure attachment style right there. So he he. He, he will develop in other aspects cognitively. He can, he can become an engineer and all that, but uh, psychically he still may be uh, caught in the, with an insecure attachment style. In relationships, that manifests in dysfunctional relationships. It could be the marriage that's conflict habituated, the hostile dependent relationship, so the emotional cutoff marriage or the emotional divorce marriage. They're married, but they're emotionally divorced kind of thing. Uh, or they find some kind of con marriage of convenience kind of arrangement. It doesn't have that marriage being like fine wine, getting better and better. It's the, you don't see these couples making I statements, you know, um, because if, in a dysfunctional marriage, if someone makes an I statement, the other one projects rejecting mother onto the person. They think they're being criticized, and then the argument's back on. Because they're caught in the repetition compulsion of not getting their symbiotic needs met. Right. 
So the choice is always there. Either we repeat or we stop and talk about it and heal. Repeat or heal. Something like that. Yeah, one author said something to that effect. We have a choice to either be Sisyphus and, uh, or let's talk about it and uh, let's, let's uh, work towards facing the ambivalence and uh, uh, let's repair the image we have of the other and by doing so we repair the image we have of ourself. Other repara reparation leads to self-reparation that leads to uh, the psychological birth and access to the real self. So I'll just do a quick zip through. By projecting or responsibility shifting one's undesirable mental or emotional notions onto another person, the individual is defended against having to be aware of and accountable to their own thought process. Projective identification is a mental mechanism whereby the self experiences the unconscious fantasy of translocating aspects of itself into an object for defensive purposes. These are unwanted split-off aspects of the self. Splitting contributes to an unrealistic view of the world in which people are felt to be all good or all bad, a major contributor of intolerance and prejudice. Maturing consists of the capacity to tolerate ambivalence. Alex Thymic clients may experience somatic reactions as a substitute for affects they cannot identify. The child's neurosis, the basic defense being identification with the aggressor. Yeah, heavy topics, huh? It's heavy stuff, huh? <laughs> yeah, projection, splitting, alexthymia, uh, somatic symptoms being an expression of unconscious conflict and then uh, the baby not being allowed to go through the separation individuation pro process because he's caught in the arrested development of an insecure attachment style where he had to quote identify with his mother that's that's the theory of that's called a defense mechanism how does the baby deal with the mother's rejecting thoughts and difficult thoughts. The theory is the baby can't. He can split it off and disassociate it to some degree, but it reaches, it might reach a point where the baby, it becomes too much and, and most of the baby's mind is now those negative thoughts. That's the narcissistic pattern. So you can see how people with a narcissistic pattern are often cynical and all that, right? So they're, they're caught uh, in the insecure attachment style. Pause it here for now. So thank you very much. This has been TQ 274 to 278. More to follow. Thank you. Bye for now.